Rob Eilif, our speaker today, is going to talk about Newton and uh, unorthodoxy, as you see. Um, uh, Religion is one of those subjects that the Royal Society um, uh, sometimes has interesting discussions about. Um, but here we're not talking about the Royal Society's views, we're talking about Isaac Newton's views, and that's safer ground in all sorts of ways. Um, Rob uh, moved to uh, Sussex University to be professor of history of science there, um, and he's, uh, he's recently uh, published a very short introduction to Newton, which is only 144 pages, I believe. So if you want a very short introduction, that's the best you're going to get. Um, he's also uh, got a uh, substantial grant to put an awful lot of uh, Newton material online and already has put, you said, two and a half million words, pages? Words. W words. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> books. Um, there's a huge Newton industry and Rob's at its heart. Um, so he's an excellent person to guide us through the uh, dangerous byways of unorthodox theology. Rob. Right, thanks very much. Um, this is uh, Sir Isaac Newton. This is a, a late portrait, um, one of the sort of nine or ten, we think, most uh, accurate portraits of, of Newton. Some of them are more accurate than others. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, standard ways of thinking about uh, Newton for um, a few minutes at the start. Um, there are two isms there for which I apologise. It's, it's a question of how we think about the place of uh, science and religion in uh, Newton's thought. Um, from the uh, 18th century, uh, partly and ironically uh, caused by Newton himself, Newton, let, let's get this clear at the start, he's a, a deeply committed Christian. Uh, he spends uh, most of his life uh, doing theology, uh, I think, rather than practicing religion. He, his study of the Bible, his study of ancient texts is, is part of his religious activity. Uh, he clearly, clearly takes that to be a much more significant enterprise, i.e. the salvation of his soul. He takes that to be a much more significant enterprise than uh, the kinds of things he tossed off uh, over breakfast like the calculus and the Principia and so on and so forth. Um, from his point of view, theology is, is primary, and I think that we should, we should remember that. Um, but ironically, of course, he becomes the founder of reason in the 18th century. Uh, there's a period in Britain uh, up until the end of the 18th century where it's recognised that you can be a good Anglican and also a good natural philosopher, natural philosopher being the word for scientist at the time. Um, the problem, and Newton is, is conventionally seen by uh, British people at least, and by many French people and others, as, as somebody who combines being a good Anglican with being a, a great uh, natural philosopher, the, the first genius of science. The problem with that story, as we uh, will come to know, is that Newton is not a good Anglican. When you get into the early 19th century, uh, you get strident claims, which are, for various reasons I'll call positivism. You get strident claims that what matters in uh, history, what matters in contemporary science in the 1820s and 30s, and what has mattered throughout history is the progress of science. Um, science is seen as, as progressive, uh, it's, it's almost uniquely progressive amongst uh, human thought. It stands for progress. Nothing else progresses, uh, perhaps, except for the British parliamentary system. Um, that's what people believed at the time, anyway. Um, but science definitely uh, progresses. It, it, it's accretory. You, you build up uh, one bit on top of the triumphs of the previous generation. Uh, sometimes you get people who are completely revolutionary, like Newton, but on the whole... Uh, you build on what's gone before. Um, science is timeless because uh, you discover truths that will, of course, since they're true, be true for all time. When you look back uh, on the past as a historian, uh, the, the way of thinking from this perspective, the way of thinking about people who've lived in the past, is to separate the good bits from the bad bits. So if you are a true Enlightenment person, 
and you believe that science is the, uh, is the, the thing that energises enlightenment, the, the move away from superstition, then you have a problem with people like Galileo, uh, Kepler, Copernicus, uh, Newton, and others, because they're deeply committed Christians. Some of them are deeper than others. Um, in the case of Newton, um, it's known from a very early period that there's a kind of dark side to his works. Um, he did alchemy. That's known. Um, it's known that he did theology as well. If you are someone writing in the 18th, uh, particularly the 19th and tw early 20th centuries, then what you do is you say uh, essentially that um, that person is... Um, is broken in half. So half of what this person's doing is forward thinking, it's rational, it's scientific, and the other part of the brain is irrational, uh, it's occult. It, it's dealing with things that pertain more to the Renaissance uh, than to the modern world. Religious convictions can always be explained away. Uh, so Newton did what people did in his own time, and that's unfortunate, but he did do that. So from the, a kind of enlightenment perspective, uh, we, we, we take out those bits that are good and true and we reject and explain away all those other bits. Those other bits are, are ephemeral. They're not going to last very long. They were things uh, that people believed at the time. This is a fundamentally unhistorical uh, point of view uh, and it's dominant in thinking about Newton and arguably about science until the 1950s. Um, many people who worked on Newton uh, at the beginning of the discipline of history of science uh, made their names by devoting their careers to one tiny part of Newton's work. So uh, one person is almost single-handedly responsible for publishing all of Newton's mathematical papers, Tom Whiteside. That's what he did for most of his career. Other people spent most of their careers on aspects of Newton's physics. And they did that in the 1950s uh, and 1960s. In the 1960s, however, um, there is a change. Um, people begin to look at other areas of, of Newton's works, and uh, people take much more seriously the fact that Newton was an alchemist. Uh, people take much more seriously uh, the fact that for Newton, um, the world was alive. Uh, it doesn't look like that when you read the Principia, but when you look at Newton's private writings, in science or natural philosophy. He believes that the world is alive. You can't use proofs in the Principia to explain how a fetus grows. You can't use proofs in the Principia, proofs in the Principia to explain how uh, creatures grow and die. It can't explain certain chemical phenomena. He thinks alchemy can from an early age. And he has a, a, a view which in private, at least, and as I'll show in, in some of his printed writings, is one that combines a, a deep religiosity, a, a view that God is present in the world um, and keeps the world going, with a view that's, that we call natural theology, which is that the world is perfectly designed for certain effects and ends, um, and with a view that's fundamentally vitalist, that is, there are, there are living, vital forces in the world that cannot be reduced to mechanism. So the world is not a machine for Newton. He's deeply hostile to that view. That's why he's not a mechanical philosopher. He hates the mechanical philosophy. He sees it as atheistic and the, the result, perhaps, of the devil. I mean, almost literally, Newton would suggest that the mechanical philosophy, beloved of some of his contemporaries, uh, is the work of the devil. The, the world isn't like that, according to Newton. So I want to look at some of these, um, these ideas um, there's a, an extraordinary, and, I, and I, would, I would add just to keep plugging the, the Newton project and, and Cognate projects that uh, nearly all the texts that I will uh, invoke, that I will introduce, are uh, available online. I'll try not to do too many texts, but since Newton was uh, steeped in texts, it's hard to show any pictures. There are no photographs from Newton's time. Um, there's an early, uh, an extraordinary work. It's about the only alchemical work of Newton's that survives. I mean, we, we have about 1.2 million words of Newton's alchemy, but it's nearly all notes from other people's writings. And that in itself is interesting, but clearly at some point, Newton or somebody else burned or got rid of 
um, sent for recycling some of these papers uh, on alchemy. Um, there is this text called Of Nature's Obvious Laws and Processes in Vegetation from uh, about the early 1670s, when Newton's in his early 30s. And this is an extraordinary text. Uh, it's one which uh, is, is it's fairly short, but it's a, it's a full-blown uh, cosmology which talks about living forces and spirits. Um, and it's, it's available uh, online. Uh, you, can, you can look it up under Newton's chemistry, spelled C-H-Y-M-I-S-T-R-Y. Um, but it's, it is one of the most remarkable documents that Newton ever wrote. And it, it gives a, a fully blown uh, account, as I've said, of, of this, um, this, this cyclical uh, cosmos, a, a, a world that's constantly in renewal, that's living. And as an alchemist, Newton believes that he can control, he can discover and control some of these forces. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I wanted to excerpt uh, one particular point in that document where uh, he says that uh, God creates the basic forms of nature. Um, of protoplasts, those are the, kind of the, the, the basic original forms of things. Of protoplasts, the idea is that nature can only nourish and not form them. So the natural world does not create the, the basic building blocks of nature. That can only be done by God. Now, that comes from a private alchemical work, but in December 1675, when Newton was involved in disputes over his theory of light because he didn't want to say what uh, a ray of light was, he didn't want to say what the physical causes of light were, he was forced by the secretary of the Royal Society, Henry Oldenburg, to uh, give, for the benefit of the fellows of the Royal Society, uh, a much more expansive account of what he thought of the world. And extraordinarily, he was doing many other things, but he did so. Uh, and over four weeks in the winter of 1675-76, uh, an extraordinary document, uh, which we call the Hypothesis, was read out to the Royal Society. And the, it, it is an extraordinary uh, document. I mean, we, we all know about the Principia and Optics. Those are his two major works. But this is one that was published in the sense that it was read out to the Royal Society, but it was never printed. It wasn't printed until the middle of the 18th century. But this was read to fellows over uh, four weeks. And y you can see in this that he, he brings from his private alchemical researches uh, various terms and ideas into a, a more public setting. Perhaps the whole frame of nature, he says, may be nothing but various contextures of some certain ethereal spirits or vapours, at first by the immediate hand of the creator and ever since by the power of nature which by virtue of the command, increase and multiply, become a complete imitator of the copies set her by the protoplast. Thus perhaps may all things be originated from ether. Now e ether is something that contemporaries believed was some kind of invisible uh, fluid that existed I all around us. It's invisible so you can't see it. But it, it's invoked by mechanical philosophers and sometimes by Newton to explain things like electricity and magnetism. Because if you don't invoke some kind of invisible fluid to explain those phenomena, then you know, how the hell does electricity and magnetism come to be, as, as Newton would see it? Um, this private view of the world um, does show its face, in a sense, in, in, a, in a remarkable uh, passage in the Principia Mathematica, which was published in 1687. Um, where Newton uh, introduces his private view that uh, the world was life on planet Earth uh, was first seeded by comets. Now, uh, there is a fair amount of work uh, on this. I mean, that view is quite common. I mean, Lord Kelvin uh, believes that in the 1880s and 1890s. So it's a fairly pervasive view. There are many people in the 20th century and early 21st century who believe the same thing. Well, not many people know that this is something that Newton worked on uh, a lot. And to some extent, it, it's, it underlies his, uh, his understanding of comets as, as having elliptical orbits. You know, he, he knows that, planet, that, that comets can have different kinds of orbits, but those that have closed elliptical orbits have a, a specific function in Newton's cosmos. 
And that, co that, that function, as he sees it, and this was printed in 1687 in Latin, so it, it wasn't private, but their function is to uh, revivify the earth. Uh, as, a, as an alchemist, uh, Newton believes that uh, over time, uh, the earth tends to ossify. It, 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 it starts to die. It needs something to revivify it. Things grind to a halt. Things die, and life comes from it, but it requires a helping hand. As he says in the Principia, for the conservation of the sea and fluids, comets seem to be required, so that from their vapours and exhalations condensed, the wastes of the planetary fluids spent upon vegetation and putrefaction may be continually supplied and made up. I suspect, moreover, that it's chiefly from the comets that spirit comes. For, let's say very vaguely, that's probably oxygen. You know, to, to be anachronistic, that's what he means by oxygen. It's that part of the air that allows us to breathe. Spirit comes from comets, which is in, indeed the smallest but the most subtle and useful part of our air, and so much required to sustain the life of all things in us. Um, what this uh, account of comets shows is, is the significance of comets in Newton's system. I mean, the, the, the significance of comets is, is, is also apocalyptic. Newton uh, is a pluralist, uh, which means that he believes there's life on other planets. He won't affirm it absolutely because he can't prove it mathematically, but he does believe that. And there's a related view that Newton believes in, which is that this is not the only creation. Um, Newton believes, like most of his contemporaries, that human beings it will exist in this form on the Earth for about 6,000 years. Uh, we've had about 4,000, um, 5,000 perhaps, and there's only about 1,000 to go as far as Newton is concerned. Um, what he believes is that the Earth will be destroyed by a comet. Uh, that comet might be the great comet of 1680. It might be Halley's Comet of 1682. There are other comets that might pose uh, problems. Um, he also believes that once the Earth is destroyed, then one of the satellites of Jupiter will be plucked by God and put into the place of the Earth, and uh, a new group of humans will be created by God. And now, these are extraordinary views, but they're not completely uncommon for the, the period in which he lives. But they're interesting to know in any case. So the, the, the cometary side of things is significant. Alchemy and comets is, is, is somewhere where God and science come together. Um, what about the function of science? Well, in 1713, Newton published uh, a second edition of the Principia, 26 years after the first. And to this, he added a, a general scolium, uh, about five pages, uh, where he gave a, a, kind of a, a general outlook of his, uh, of his philosophy of the world, something that he felt followed from um, uh, the, the previous parts of the Principia. And this is uh, a firmly uh, theological view. When we talk about natural philosophy, uh, what, we, what we mean to say is that for people who wrote about natural philosophy in the 18th century, unlike, say, 20th century scientists, or most of them, natural philosophy contained within it the idea of natural theology. The vast majority of people, 99.9% uh, you know, .9 of people uh, who did natural philosophy, though there weren't professional scientists in those days, but they did it, if you like, as a hobby uh, in their leisure time. Uh, these people are committed Christians in Western Europe. They're committed Christians. They believe that when they look around them, they look at the beauty of nature, they look at the order of nature, uh, they, they look at the parts of the body working in harmony with each other, and they believe that these things could not possibly have arisen by chance. It's absurd for these people. Uh, it's absurd, so they see it, to think that these things could have arisen by chance. And they're also interested, if you like, uh, to be anachronistic, in, in the anthropological uh, principle, the anthropomorphic, anthropologic, anth anthropomorphic principle, that they are fascinated by the fact that uh, the conditions of life are so unexpected that, that life as we know it could only have come about by a designer. And Newton writes a lot about that. Um, all the planets go round in a certain direction. If we were further out, 
from Earth. We'd be too cold if we were closer in. It would be too hot for us to live. There is a sun at the center of the solar system. Uh, this gives life. Um, it's all designed. It's obvious to Newton and to his colleagues. At the end of the general scolium, uh, in the 1726 version, which is the final one, a year before he died, um, he says uh, in, a, in a reasonably well-known uh, passage, lest the systems of fixed stars should, by their gravity, fall on each other, God has placed them at immense distances from one another. We know him only by his most wise and excellent contrivances of things and final causes. We admire him for his perfections, but we reverence and adore him on account of his dominion. Thus much concerning God, to discourse of whom from the appearances of things does certainly belong to natural philosophy. He said experimental philosophy in the 1713 edition. But um, this is not just something for show. This is not just something to make it look as though Newton is uh, a deeply religious person. He believes this. It almost goes without saying, although he says it here, it goes without saying that when you read the book of nature, you are reading off the presence and intelligence of uh, an extraordinary, all-powerful creator who created the world as it is through, through an act of will alone. Right? Uh, he didn't use... Uh, tools or mechanisms, but the very beginning of the world, as Newton sees it, uh, was created by God just by thinking, just by, because he wanted to do it, it happened. There's not much in the 1687 Principia on God, um, but there's a famous letter to uh, Richard Bentley, um, who was in 1700 to become the master of Newton's college, Trinity. Uh, where Newton sets out in some detail the, uh, the, the thinking behind his system. And he says, uh, when I wrote my treatise about our system, I had an eye upon such principles as might work with considering men for the belief of a deity. Nothing can rejoice me more than to find it useful for that purpose. Um, that's a, a picture of a, a galaxy that um, had Newton seen it would have, and contemporaries would um, certainly have made them uh, wonder. Uh, and marvel. Um, in the same letter to uh, Richard Bentley, uh, Newton uh, expostulates on the, the, the issue I've just, I've just mentioned. This is a, a small part of it, and I'll only read out the bold bit. You'll be pleased to know. Um, but this is a long account of how incredible it is that we exist. If things had been ever so slightly different, we wouldn't be here. Right? But the fact that we're here shows uh, to all reasonable thinking people, as far as Newton's concerned, um, that there must be a great designer. Why there is one body in our system qualified to give light and heat to all the rest, I know no reason, but because the author of the system thought it convenient. Okay, third element. This is the most important thing, I think, that Newton studied apart from scripture, the sensorium. Um, it's a key issue for Newton throughout his career. The sensorium is our brain. Uh, when you think about God, uh, the sensorium is the entire world. What Newton and others think is that the relationship between our body and our mind is similar in some respects to the relationship between creation and God. Because we're made in his image, if we can find out how we move our own bodies... If we can find out what the relationship is between our bodies and our mind, we will get a better understanding of how it is that God created the world. Now, um, some people, some of Newton's contemporaries agree with this, um, but the, the way that Newton deals with it is remarkable and remarkably sustained. The earliest writings we have, the earliest notebooks we have from Newton's time at Cambridge um, are researches by Newton on exactly that issue, um, partly through uh, experiments on his eyeball. Many of you may know that he, he did experiments on his eyeball by thrusting things under his eyeball and, and moving uh, bodkins, uh, toothpicks and pieces of brass uh, around by putting the stuff as far back as he could. Um, and he had to stay in bed for two weeks afterwards with the curtains drawn. Um, but the reason he's doing this is, is partly to work out... That this is a very early age, he's 22... 23, he wants to know how much of our vision is due to free will 
uh, and how much is due to what's going on outside us. And he, he uh, decides uh, that these are the origins of, of the experiments that lead to his work on light. Um, he decides that half of what we see is down to our will, so we, we have a great deal of uh, influence over what we see, and half of it is caused by the outside world. Um, as he goes on in the 1670s and 80s, he does more and more sophisticated experiments to try and work out how it is we move our own bodies. In the hypothesis I mentioned earlier on in 1675, he refers to a whole series of experiments, uh, most of which were done by Robert Boyle, on squashing tadpoles inside an air pump. And what, he wants, what Newton wants to say, or what he wants to show by means of these experiments, is that the soul, that's the, the, the thing that operates our mind, um, moves our own bodies by very quickly and subtly transforming the, the, the pressure of this invisible ether inside our muscles. And this is very, as you can imagine, this is, since it's invisible, it's very, very difficult to do experiments on it. Um, crushing tadpoles uh, in water in an air pump by compressing uh, water inside an air pump and seeing if there are any bubbles that come out of the tadpole. Um, hideous as that kind of experiment is. That's one of the only kinds of evidence we can get for the, the, the sorts of subtle airs or ethers that are inside our body. As I say, this is, this is not just, um, even though it's a, it's a major topic, it's not just about trying to work out how we move our own bodies. Important enough as that is. It's not just about free will, because self-motion and free will are intimately combined with each other. Um, you, you can see, by the way, that this is immediately related to the notion that Newton has that God created the world through an act of will. Um, if, as I say, if we can t determine how we move our own bodies by thought alone, we can determine, as far as Newton's concerned, how it is that the world was created. And there is a, a tadpole. I say it's hard to get pictures uh, from the 17th century, but that is a, a concrete tadpole. Um, in the early 18th century, uh, I think that the sensorium issue became the major research topic for Newton. Um, and he becomes president of the Royal Society um, in November 1703. And one of the first things he does is to direct the instrument maker, Francis Hawksby, uh, to work on electrostatic uh, devices. And we know from the second edition of the optics, the Latin Optica of 1706, that this is in various... Uh, pieces of text called queries that he added to the end of these texts, that Newton was by this time obsessed with electricity. And one of the reasons he's obsessed with electricity, he thinks it might be the fundamental force in nature. One of the reasons is he now thinks that the, the mind-body relationship is mediated by electricity. If you put electric shocks through people, you kill them. Um, sometimes people uh, have fallen to the ground. Um, if you put an electric shock through them, they revivify. There's something peculiar about electricity and life. And Newton's already onto that in 1706, 1707. Um, so, in this period, uh, he thinks that there's a, a close connection uh, between free will, the will, the soul, the mind, and electricity. Perhaps, instead of ether, we control electric impulses in our body. And you can sort this out experimentally. From query 28 in 1717, um, we can see, uh, again, a famous passage um, uh, which uh, I hope uh, corroborates what I'm saying uh, and, and I hope, uh, in a sense, validates the, the point I'm making that this is uh, extremely important. There can't be anything more important than trying to work out how God created the world. And what a wonderful idea that uh, we could find out about that by doing experiments on ourselves. So self-experiment leads uh, peculiarly to an understanding of how the world was created. Um, I won't uh, go into detail on this, but in th this quotation alone shows you how uh, thinking about the will in animals uh, leads to thinking about uh, the relationship between God and his creation. And you can see that. Uh, if, if you, um, again, if you go to our 
uh, Newton project and search for sensorium. Uh, that's, that's something that Newton's obsessed with, and it comes up a lot. Um, scriptural hermeneutics. Uh, again, scriptural hermeneutics means how do you understand the Bible? Um, a letter to Thomas Burnett of uh, 1681 uh, makes it clear that Newton's alchemical views uh, give him uh, a handle on uh, how he thinks the uh, creation was uh, accomplished in the first few days. Uh, and this is, again, I'll, I won't go into detail on this, but what he suggests to Thomas Burnett, um, who, who would very quickly publish a book called The Sacred Theory of the Earth, what this suggests to uh, Newton is that if you look at some of the alchemical processes, the chemical processes that take place on Earth, um, you will begin to see how from a, a kind of uh, homogenous chaos at the beginning of the world, uh, various things formed naturally. It's as if God put um, uh, alchemical powers into the Earth and then let them left them to their own devices. That's what happens. If you can look at uh, pewter or tin uh, in various alchemical experiments, Newton says, and see what happens to them. Things like hills, uh, variegation, heterogeneity uh, appears after a while through chemical processes. If you understand the causes of these things, he says, uh, this answer will perhaps serve um, for understanding how uh, hills and so on came from the chaos. Okay. Um, very... Uh, fascinatingly, Newton has a, a very rich theory about um, why it is that the Bible seems to be wrong about the world. The Bible is geocentric. Uh, the Bible holds that the earth is at the center of the universe, and yet Newton knows that the sun is at the center of the solar system. Um, this is, again, a very famous passage uh, to Thomas Burnett. Uh, what he says is that uh, when Moses... Uh, tells people um, that, uh, the, for example, the, the, the sun and the moon uh, are the same size. Um, he doesn't really mean absolutely literally that they're the same size. He is, uh, he's in, as, as they say in the jargon, he's accommodating his talk to the perceptual faculties of the vulgar, silly people who don't understand um, that the sun and the moon are grossly different in size. Um, but what he does, uh, what Moses does, is talk to them in the language they best understand. Um, Moses' business being not to correct vulgar opinions in matters philosophical, but to adapt a description of the creation as handsomely as he could to the sense and capacity of the vulgar. And again, I won't go into detail with this text because it can do your head in. Um, but it's important to know that, that Newton has a, a, a very sophisticated theory uh, of how to understand passages in scripture that seem to go against the truthful tenets of science. Key here, I think, is the idea that Newton has that, as we see, that ordinary people see the world in relative terms. Um, when we wake up in the morning, uh, and if we look at the sun uh, through tinted specks for two or three hours, we will see the sun rise. Uh, we don't see the earth turning on its axis. We don't know that until very clever astronomers come along. So Newton is famed for being uh, an empiricist. That is somebody who believes that scientific truths come from observation and experiment. But he's not a crude empiricist. For the most part, he thinks that uh, observation, information we get through the senses, has to be processed by clever, rational people uh, before we can understand truths. Ordinary people have their own truths. They see the world in a certain way. But experts know better. Okay? In the case of uh, understanding scripture, and also in natural philosophy and science, you need experts to tell you what's real and absolute. Because we see the world in relative terms. We, we don't, ordinary people don't have the capacity to understand absolute truths about the world. And in a, in a draft of the Principia from mid-1685, um, he says the following, and there's a, there's a passage like this in the Principia. 
Ordinary people fail to abstract thought from sensible appearances, and they always speak of relative quantities, so much so that it would be absurd for wise men or even prophets to speak about them otherwise. Both the sacred writings and theological writings are always to be understood in terms of relative quantities. He who would on this account bandy words with philosophers or dispute with philosophers concerning the absolute motions of natural things would be labouring under a gross <coughs> misapprehension. Uh, you can see here, I'm moving towards the point, Newton thinks that um, experts in natural philosophy and in, um, in uh, understanding scripture and in theology are people who know truths that are inaccessible to ordinary people. Um, finally, uh, in this section, uh, just to go through very quickly, Newton thinks that Stonehenge um, was an ancient vestal, for a form of vestal worship. Um, in the beginning, Newton thinks, everybody knew scientific truths. The very first men, Adam, Noah, Solomon, David, they knew science. But gradually this learning was corrupted and we came to an understanding, Newton thinks, that the earth is at the centre of the cosmos. In the old times, Newton thinks, and you can see this in Stonehenge, uh, you can see it all over the world, um, people had a rational form of worship. And that rational form of worship was one that was sun-centred, it was heliocentric, um, and people would walk round in a circle around a fire that burned in the middle of uh, a circle surrounded by henges. That was the ancient religion, as Newton saw it. Um, again, in, in this, he's not uh, completely different from his contemporaries. But there are specific Newtonian elements that mark it out as, as being different. Um, here he talks about how uh, placing the fire in the common centre of the courts uh, was supposed to represent or imitate the, the world, the structure of the world. And then crucially at the bottom of this, he says, a point of religion than which nothing can be more rational. If you want to find evidence that Newton uh, applied scientific principles to his study of the Bible, which I think is unhelpful, then this is evidence for you. You know, Newton thinks that at the beginning of time, before Christianity came, uh, science was rational. The first religion was the most rational of all others till the nations corrupted it. That's because, he says, uh, people like the Babylonians, the Egyptians and the Chinese started worshipping heavenly bodies instead of understanding them for what they were. In the beginning, Newton thinks there was the true worship, which was the monotheistic worship of uh, one God. Right. Newton, as I've presented him so far, uh, engaged in uh, thinking about science and religion that was fundamentally connected. Uh, there are lots of areas that I've shown you where there's connectedness between science and religion. But in the last few minutes, I, I want to say that that way of thinking about Newton is, is wrong and we, 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 can't, we can't deal with it. It's based on a selective reading of Newton's works. So the, uh, the material I've shown you represents about, uh, from the theological side, represents about 1% of his theological writings. 1%. Less than 1%, actually. Less than half a percent. Um, there's also a, a kind of inferiority complex that people who worked on this material in the 1970s and 80s, who wanted to show a much more rounded Newton, um, they, they still have an inferiority complex. That is, they, in, in a sense, they want to show that it's okay to deal with Newton's non-scientific stuff because it feeds into the scientific stuff. So a superiority complex sort of manifests itself as an inferiority complex. They're, they're too scared to treat Newton's theology and alchemy in its own terms. Um, what if uh, we reversed the, the kind of old Enlightenment view where science was pristine and great and religion was superstitious nonsense. What if we reversed that and looked at things, if you like, from Newton's point of view, which is that theology is what matters? Uh, and he says this, you know, science and mathematics, uh, that stuff interested me for a while, he says in 1675, but it's become tedious. Um, I want to do other things that are more important. Um, what if that's true? And what if it is very, very difficult to make 99% of what Newton did in theology link up to his science. Um, 
the 99% of stuff is what we look at in the Newton project. It's prophecy. It belongs to a completely different apocalyptic Protestant tradition. Um, this is millions of words uh, written about the whore of Babylon. And that's the whore of Babylon there on a, on a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. Newton spent more time thinking about the whore of Babylon and the two, the two horned and ten horned beasts than he did about the Principia. Much more time, probably ten times as much time. Um, what do we make of that? Do we just reject that as an unfortunate side effect of Newton living in the late 17th century? Um, Newton is part of a Protestant apocalyptic tradition, but he's not a conventional Protestant apocalypticist. He has a very radical, uh, different take on the history of the world from other people. Everything that, to a certain extent, links Catholics and Anglicans uh, about the history of Christianity, i.e. that orthodox Christianity began in the 4th and 5th centuries, all of that Newton rejects. Uh, he, he dislikes what his colleagues at Trinity College believe in as much as he detests what Roman Catholics believe in, and he detests that a great deal. Um, this is somebody who is uh, radical and innovative, and just to... Um, move on to a conclusion shortly, I will say that that is what connects uh, Newton's uh, natural philosophy and his, um, and his theology. Um, this is the man he hated, the founder of orthodox uh, tr Trinitarian Christianity. Uh, the man who, um, in effect, as, as far as orthodox Christians uh, are concerned, forced Newton's hero, a priest called Arius, to die in ignominious circumstances, in a bog house in 335. Now, did I make that up? Well, I mean, did I make that up in, ter in terms of what Newton believes? Uh, no. This is, this is the, the, the piece that starts off. Um, this is a paper called Paradoxical Questions uh, Concerning Athanasius. Uh, question one, uh, if you can, I don't know if you can read it, but this bit here, I'll just read it out. Whether the ignominious death of Arius in a bog house uh, was not feigned and put about by Athanasius about 20 years after his death. Um, this goes on for thousands, tens of thousands of words. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of notes for this particular analysis. This is what Newton uh, was concerned about. What does it have to do with the Principia? Can we connect them up? I would say no. Um, a gratuitous uh, excerpt from part of um, Newton's text on Athanasius um, which is, is, this is a very important text for me because I think this is one of the very few occasions where we, we get an idea of Newton's own personal uh, sort of moral and sexual uh, views. Um, this, is a, this is a classic piece of Newton from uh, his prophetic writings. Some people, he says, think that monks in the 4th and 5th century were the most holy men, but this is a great prejudice, <laughs> and such a prejudice as judicious men like me who have read and considered their lives, can scarce fall into. They seem to me to have been the most unchaste and superstitious part of mankind, as well in this first age as in all following ages. To turn a monk was to run into such temptation, I'm now going back here, such temptation as Christ has taught us to pray that God would not lead us into. For lust, by being forcibly restrained and by struggling with it, is always inflamed. Don't struggle with lust, you won't win, is what he's saying. The way to be chaste is not to contend and struggle with unchaste thoughts, but to decline them. Keep the mind employed about other things. And a classic Newton quote, he that's always thinking of chastity will be always thinking of women. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> whether that's true or not, that, that, that's, his, that's his attack on, on, on Catholic mores, if you like. Um, and this goes on for thousands and thousands of words. And what does that have to do with the Principia? Uh, not a great deal. Uh, it's hard to make those things connected. Um, Newton himself endorses the view that prophecy and natural philosophy, mathematical natural philosophy, are completely separate. Um, in one, uh, again, extraordinary text from the early 1680s, about 250,000 words, which must have taken up uh, an entire year in the early 1680s before he wrote the Principia. He writes... I cannot but on this occasion reprove the blindness of a sort of people who are so perverse as to call upon other men for such a demonstration of the certainty of faith in the scriptures that a mere natural man, how wicked soever, who will but read it, may judge of it 
and perceive the strength of it with as much perspicuity and certainty as he can a demonstration in Euclid. I could wish they would consider how contrary it is to God's purpose that the truth of his religion should be as obvious and perspicuous to all men as a mathematical uh, demonstration. Um, I want to uh, just conclude here by saying uh, that what we're dealing with is, is a, what we call in history a, a historiographical problem. Um, what do we do with Newton? Is he a schizophrenic in uh, a historical sense? I mean, what do we do with someone who can think all these different things before breakfast? Um, what do we do with people in history whose lives cannot be connected up? How do we deal with them? I mean, it, it, do, we, uh, do we claim there's some kind of pathology? Uh, or is it just that actually people do think different things, very, very different things, uh, depending on the audience, the circumstances, and so on and so forth? We know, how dif we know how radical an anti-Trinitarian Newton was. We know this from uh, the Newton Project. Uh, we know how dangerous it would have been for him to have made his views known to others. But he viewed himself as one of the elect, chosen by God to pass on the basic truths of Christianity to others. If Newton lacked the courage of his convictions to actually voice his views in public, this was partly because he was part of a larger historical story outlined in the Apocalypse. He, of course, reads himself into the Apocalypse, as one of the elect. The apocalypse is about the godly, i.e. people like him. Reading was part of his gigantic, dis reading even part of his gigantic dissertations on prophecy throws up occasional similarities with work in other fields. Uh, he condemns, for example, feigning hypotheses and framing conjectures in his prophetic work, just as he famously did in science. Yet, this is not the same kind of thing. He thought he had pretty much proved that the Pope was Antichrist, condemning as fanciful or conjectural or hypothetical theories that denied this. And also, he thought they were absurd. At other times, he was adamant that one could not demonstrate prophetic truths as one did propositions in Euclid, as we've seen. In general, it's pretty much impossible to read Newton's gigantic 1680s tome on the history of the corruption of the church and see connections between that and the style and content of the Principia. Do we produce this, this reverse positivism? I mean, should we just assume with Newton that there is no connection, in a sense, between these different areas, uh, and we privilege the theology above the science and the mathematics? Um, that doesn't seem to be right either, because we've seen that there are lots of connections as well. Um, despite Newton's strictures about not confusing uh, modes of proof in prophecy and natural philosophy, there are some general links, I think, we can make between his projects in natural philosophy and prophecy. In both prophecy and natural philosophy, uh, he believes that there are men who are capable of, uh, of imbibing or eating what in scripture is called meat for men. Those are difficult truths that people who've passed through a kind of basic apprenticeship stage are able to take on board. In both areas, for example, we saw that um, people who are highly skilled, uh, highly learned people in uh, astronomy, mathematical natural philosophy, and scriptural studies uh, can tell the difference between absolute and relative qualities, relative quantities. Sometimes uh, people uh, in history talk down to vulgar people uh, in order to make themselves understood because we as ordinary human beings experience the world in relative terms. We need people who are clever and skilled, both in scripture and science, to tell us uh, what is true. He's unorthodox in every area. It would require another lecture or two to tell you just how unorthodox he is in natural philosophy. But he's completely unlike any of his contemporaries. In his mathematics, he's self-taught, with uh, a few exceptions. He's radically original. Um, he makes a, a moral compass around, if you like, saying no, uh, denying what most people take to be true. That goes for uh, religion as mu and scripture and the history of Christianity as much as it does for mathematics and for science. Uh, there's something, you know, that when we talk about Newton being split in various ways, there's something that nevertheless does uh, cohere in Newton's personality. And in fact, wh what it is that coheres probably is just Newton's personality. Um, he's unorthodox in all areas, but is he successful in all areas? Newton believed 
he was successful in all areas. Um, he thought he'd rediscovered the true religion. Okay, he did the Principia, that was good. You know, it's, it's not bad. Uh, he discovered calculus. Uh, that's also pretty good. But the most important thing he did, as he saw it, was um, to discover the truths of Christianity. And those truths are anti-Trinitarian. The anti-Trinitarian view that Christ is created by God. Um, he's not the same as God. Christ is not a God. He should be worshipped, but he's not a God. That is the fundamental truth. All right? There is one God, as far as Newton is concerned. He thought discovering the true religion was his greatest feat. Thank you.